Good morning. Today is March 28th, 2021, and it is Palm Sunday, the beginning of Holy Week for Christians. We welcome you to the First Presbyterian Churches of Highland and Marlboro. We are yoked congregations in Ulster County, New York, in Hudson River Presbytery. Our lesson for Palm Sunday from the New Testament is Mark chapter 11, verses 1 through 11. Listen now for God's word. When they were approaching Jerusalem at Bethpage and Bethany near the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples and said to them, Go into the village ahead of you, and immediately as you enter it, you will find tied there a colt that has never been ridden. Untie it and bring it. If anyone says to you, Why are you doing this? Just say this, the Lord needs it, and we'll send it back here immediately. They went away and found a colt tied near a door outside in the street. And as they were untying it, some of the bystanders said to them, What are you doing? What are you doing untying the colt? And they told them what Jesus had said, and they allowed them to take it. Then they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks on it, and he sat on it. Many people spread their cloaks on the road, and others spread leafy branches that they had cut in the fields. Then those who went ahead and those who followed were shouting, Hosanna! Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our ancestor David. Hosanna in the highest heaven. Then Jesus entered Jerusalem and went into the temple, and when he had looked around at everything, as it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. <clears throat> the sermon title this morning is The Last Temptation of Christ. Count me among those who missed the full pageantry of the Macy's Thanksgiving Parade in 2020. I have lost track of the number of years that I have attended the parade in person. I like the honesty of the parade. It does product placement on a grand scale. The Nestle's Quick Bunny Balloon openly promotes that powdered confection, and Kermit the Frog's balloon further increases his popularity. When I go to the Macy's Parade, I know what to expect. I can be assured that for a few hours I will be fascinated with the wonder of commercialized Christmas. When I spread my blankets on the pavement of Broadway, preparing a place to sit and watch the parade, it is with great anticipation of what will happen next. Such was the attitude of the followers of Jesus when they spread their garments and leafy branches on the streets of Jerusalem. The disciples of Jesus and those who followed the Nazarene had great expectations of the man they were celebrating. When they spread their garments on the road, they did so according to the coronation custom passed on to them from the Hebrew tradition. Jesus rode the colt over the parade route, heralded as a royal one from the kingdom of David. Many regarded him as the Messiah who, at long last, would save them from their oppression. Realize that the people who praised Jesus during his parade were very much like him, poor people who were oppressed in their own land by a distant ruler. They were not following Jesus for religious reasons alone. They were not merely desiring forgiveness of sins. These people were desperate because of the ruthless political system that made every day a struggle. On that colt, on that day, rode their hope. The hope that Jesus would liberate them in the name of God from their economic and political captivity. 
Remember what the Judeans were facing back then. The Roman Empire controlled Palestine, Jesus' homeland. The Romans were overlords of the land, and they used Herodian kings as puppet rulers to squeeze every last denarii from the people who already were extremely poor. Each year, Rome made a bad situation worse by increasing taxes, yet the people did not passively accept their plight. There was constant guerrilla warfare. To respond to the uprisings, the Roman Empire sent its best troops into Judea. Pontius Pilate was appointed as the colonial governor because of his record for ruthless effectiveness. The strong measures employed by Rome inform us of the level of resistance by the people of Judea. It was out of this political context that many people followed Jesus. They had been battered down, exploited for their labor, taxed out of most of their earnings, and brutalized in ways both subtle and violent. These people needed hope, and in Jesus they found the hope of imminent deliverance. For many of the followers of Jesus, the kingdom of God was envisioned as a land of plenty and a time of peace. It was not a remote thought. The kingdom of God was urgent. And so they cheered. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. But what of that one? What of Jesus? What was he doing in the middle of the parade? The writer of Mark portrays a Jesus who is silent. He does not speak during the parade through Jerusalem. It seems fitting that he would be silent. I imagine Jesus had a lot on his mind. His life was at a high point, but after highs, there are lows. And he had to know that this celebration eventually would come to an end. One can only conjecture what Jesus was thinking in his silence, but I have the feeling that he was experiencing an internal struggle. In fact, I consider this day to be a temptation for Jesus, as was his temptation in the desert, as would be his temptation to come down from the cross. While it seems logical that a certain part of Jesus might have enjoyed the attention focused on him, with that pleasure came temptation. The people who spread their garments, the people who raised their voices with royal psalms, these people were telling Jesus, we want you to be our Messiah. We want you to be the Christ. Messiah and Christ, they mean the same thing. The Greek word for Messiah is Christos, and it means anointed. What's wrong with that? Why would that be a temptation? After all, today we confess Jesus to be the Christ. The difficulty for Jesus is that there really was no way he could be the Messiah for all his followers because with that title came certain expectations. The Zealots wanted the Messiah to be a military leader who would lead them in a revolt against Rome. John the Baptist expected the Messiah to be a judge who would destroy the evil ones. The Essenes wanted the Messiah to be a priest who would bring back the purity of their religion. It was impossible for Jesus to be each of these. He could not be priest, judge, and military leader all at once. Yet it had to be tempting. He could have fulfilled at least one of these roles. Jesus obviously was a gifted man. He could have led the guerrilla forces against the Romans he was a man of charisma who automatically had a following. He could have been a judge 
separating the good from the evil and establishing the good in the kingdom of God. He could have been a priest. He certainly knew the ins and outs of Jewish law. It had to be tempting. So when we read of Jesus writing in silence, perhaps he was struggling with these possibilities. Maybe he was trying to find a way to fulfill all the hopes of those who believed in him. Jesus did what he could. He cleansed the temple. He faced the Roman authorities. He spent much of his ministry dealing with confrontation. And then his life came to a screeching halt. We know the rest of the story. At least, we know the rest of the story in Jesus' human life, and we know that he was crucified. He did not yield to the temptation to honor his followers' immediate hopes. He did not become their military leader, their judge, or their priest. He did not yield to cheap popularity. The expectations of the people were unfulfilled. Their Messiah failed them. Aside from a few healings and miracles, the people still were enslaved by their oppressors. Yet, here we are today, placing our hopes on the same one riding the colt that day. I'm sure that the resurrection and the appearance of Jesus, the risen Christ, has a lot to do with us being here as Christians. My hunch is that we are not very different from the Judeans who waved their branches and sent their hopes in the directions of Jesus. We all have expectations of who Christ is in our lives. We have particular nuances of our faith, and yet the risen Christ reminds us that Jesus is more than we ever could imagine. We may be tempted to mold Jesus into one other than who he is. Our expectations of Christ may take us away from the living witness he has given us. Let us resist our temptation, as did Christ. Let us hold fast to God's mission for Christ's followers. Let us concern ourselves with the agenda of Jesus the Christ, preaching good news to the poor and release to the captives, teaching by word and deed and blessing the children, healing the sick and binding up the brokenhearted, eating with outcasts, forgiving sinners, and calling all to repent and believe the gospel. Amen.